Kotlin coroutines is the latest, most efficient, and most effective way of asynchronous programming and multithreading in Android development. During this tutorial, I will teach you fundamentals of Kotlin coroutines. You will be able to learn about scopes, dispatchers, builders, suspending functions with context, delay, async, and await. Not only that, we will discuss some advanced areas like structured concurrency, view model scope, lifecycle scope, and live data builder. We will create different code samples during this tutorial. As usual, I have uploaded them all to GitHub and I have added download links below in the description. So, let's start. In computer science, there are two types of multitasking methods to manage multiple concurrent processes. In one type, the operating system controls the switch between processes. The other type is called cooperative multitasking, in which processes control their behavior by themselves. Coroutines are software components that create subroutines for cooperative multitasking. Coroutines were first used in 1958 for the assembly language. Developers of modern programming languages such as Python, JavaScript, and C Sharp have been using coroutines for many years. In Kotlin, a coroutine can be introduced as a sequence of well managed subtasks. To some extent, a coroutine can be considered as a lightweight thread. You can execute many coroutines in a single thread. A coroutine can also be switched between threads. That means, coroutine can be suspended from one thread and resumed from another thread. As Android developers, with the release of Kotlin 1.3, we now have a fully stable coroutines API. All the painful multi-threading tasks done with RSJava, async task, or other methods such as executors, handler threads, and intent services can be easily and efficiently done with coroutines. Coroutines API also allows us to write asynchronous codes in a sequential manner. Hence, it's all its unnecessary boilerplate codes comes with callbacks and makes our codes more readable and maintainable. Before code our first coroutine, let's very quickly discuss why we need asynchronous programming in Android development during the next lesson. Most of the smartphones has a refresh frequency of at least 60 Hz. For one second or for 1000 milliseconds, they are prepreshes 60 times. Let's divide 1000 milliseconds by 60. It is 16.666 repeating. So, if our app runs in this phone, it has to draw the screen using main thread approximately every 16 seconds. But we already have better smartphones available in the market with higher refresh rates such as 90Hz and 120Hz. If the phone has a refresh level of 90Hz, let's divide 1000 milliseconds by 90. Our app has only 11 milliseconds to perform task in the Android main thread. If the refresh level is 120 Hz, 1000 divided by 120. Our app will have only 8 milliseconds. By default, Android main thread has a set of regular responsibilities. It has to always pass XML in plate view components and draw them again and again for every refresh. Main thread also has to deal with user interactions such as click events. So, if we add more task to the main thread, if its execution time exceeds this super small time gap between two refreshes, app will show performance errors. Screen might freeze. User will see unpredictable behaviors in view components. It will even cause application not responding error. As a result of technological advancements, these refresh rates getting higher and higher every year. Therefore, as Android developers, we should always try to execute long-running tasks asynchronously in a separate thread. To achieve that, newest, most efficient, 
and most effective technology we have today is Kotlin coroutines. So, during the next lesson, we are going to proudly launch our first coroutine. To save your valuable time and to make this lesson less boring, I created a new Android Studio project. I named it as Coroutines Demo 1. I also did some coding. You can download this project from the resources of this lesson. It is there as the starter project of this lesson. If you download it now and open it with your Android Studio, you will be able to code with me. Please download it now. Coding with me is really important to learn and understand these lessons. Okay, I hope you have the code now. Let's very quickly go through the code. Here in the main activity.xml, I added two buttons and two text views. ID of this button is btn download user data. ID of this button is btn count. IDs of text views are tv message and tv count. You can study the XML here. Now, let's switch back to main activity. Here I have defined a variable to keep track of counts and assigned 0 as the initial value. This is the on click listener of the count button. Every time the user clicks on this count button, value of the count variable will increase by 1 and the new value will be displayed on the text view. Let me run the app and show you. Like this. Then, this is the on click listener of download user data button. When the user click on this button, it will call to the download user data function and a for loop will start iterating for 200,000 times. And I have also added a log statement to see the iteration count and the current executing thread. I added this download user data button to simulate a long running task. In a real lab, this might represent downloading user data from a server. So this is the code I created. I hope code is 100% clear to you. Now, this is what we are going to do. We are going to first click on this download user data button to start a long running task. And then at the same time, we are going to click on count button. So we are going to simulate two processes in the main thread. So let's run the app and have a look. Now I am going to click on download user data button first to start the for loop which simulates a heavy long running task and then click on this click here button to get the click count. We are supposed to see click count values progressing one by one as one, two, three and eventually move to ten. But we saw only ten after a little wait. That means our app was temporarily freezing. You can see here. The thread name is main. This user interface issue happened at, as a result of executing a heavy long running task in the main thread. So, to avoid that, to execute this in a separate thread, it's time to create our first core routine. I have a question for you. Are core routines and threads same? No. We have main or UI thread. We also have on demand background worker threads. But Threads are not equal to core routines. Any one of those threads can have many core routines executing in it at the same time. One thread can have many core routines running on that thread. Core routines are like just separate processes running on a thread. So, in order to use core routines, first of all, we need to add core routines dependencies to the app level gradle file. You can find them from this official Kotlin Next Core Routines GitHub page. We need to add both core and Android dependencies. This core dependency provides main API for core routines in Kotlin, and this Android dependency provides support to work with Android related components. Then click on Sync Now. Let's start with Coroutine scope. Coroutine scope is an interface provides the scope of the coroutine. We will talk more about coroutine scope during the next lesson. Then we need to provide the context. All the coroutines going to start within this scope 
will be run on this context. We need to run this task in a background thread. So let's provide dispatches.io. For now, let's just include this. I will teach you everything about dispatches during the next lesson. Dot launch. Launch is the coroutine builder. Now this will create a coroutine. Let's move this download user data function call to the coroutine. So now this function will execute inside our new coroutine. All right, that's it. Congratulations, you created your first coroutine. See how simple it is. Let's run that and see how this works. Good, as you expected, the click count button working properly without any unexpected delay. So, we just created our first coroutine. I know by now you might have a lot of questions. There are a lot of new words coroutine scope, dispatches, launch. I will explain all of them and more during the next lesson. During the previous lesson, we ended up here creating our first coroutine. Now, during this lesson, let's learn more about what we actually did. In an app, we can launch many coroutines. There can be even 100 coroutines running at the same time. But by default, coroutines don't help us to keep track of them or keep track of any work that's been done by them. If we do not manage them very carefully, there can be coroutine leaks in the memory. Resources will be unnecessarily waste and it will also affect to the performance of the application. But luckily for us, Kotlin programming language creators has already fixed that problem. In Kotlin coroutines, we have to, we must start all the coroutines within a scope. Using the properties belong to the scope, we can easily keep track of coroutines, cancel coroutines and handle errors or exceptions thrown by the coroutines. So, this coroutine scope is the interface we have used to provide the scope to our coroutine. In Kotlin coroutines, we have another scope interface called global scope. Global scope is used to launch top level coroutines which are operating on the whole application lifetime. In Android development, we very rarely use global scope. Both of these scopes also acts as a reference to the coroutine context. So, this is the context of our coroutine scope. For this context, we have only used a dispatcher as the context. We want to use an explicit job instance. We can include the name of the job instance plus a dispatcher as the context for the scope. The plus operator can be used to merge multiple coroutine context. We will study about jobs very soon during another lesson of this section. Dispatcher describes the kind of thread where the coroutine should be run. In Kotlin Android structured concurrency, it is always recommended to start coroutines using main thread and then switch to background threads. To launch coroutines in the main thread, we use dispatchers.main. We also have IO dispatcher dispatchers.io, dispatchers.default and dispatchers.unconfined. So, if we use dispatchers.main, the coroutine will run in the main thread. In Android, we also call it UI thread. You know, there is only one main or UI thread. So, if you create 10 coroutines within a scope with dispatchers.main as the context, all those 10 coroutines will run in the same main thread. We only use main dispatcher for a small lightweight task like call to a UI function, call to a suspending function or to get updates from the live data. In structured concurrency, recommended best practice is always starting a coroutine from the main thread and later switching it to a background thread. We will learn all those things very soon during other lessons of this section. If we use Dispatches.io, the coroutine will run in a background thread from a shared pool of on-demand created threads. We use this IO dispatcher 
to work with local database, communicate with network, and to work with files. Default dispatcher is used for CPU intensive tasks such as sorting a list of data with 10,000 list items or passing a huge JSON file with details of 100,000 movies. Dispatcher.unconfined is a dispatcher used with global scope. If you use dispatchers.unconfined, coroutine will run on the current thread, but if it is suspended and resumed, it will run on whichever thread that the suspending function is running on. It is not recommended to use this dispatcher for Android development. Apart from these four dispatchers, Coroutine's API also facilitates us to convert executors to dispatchers, as well as to create our own custom dispatchers. Creators of libraries like Room and Retrofit have been using their own custom dispatchers to execute operations in a separate background thread. Therefore, you will see in coming lessons, when we use Retrofit and Room, we can easily use them from the main dispatcher without writing codes to change the thread. As Android developers, most of the time, we use dispatchers.main and dispatchers.io. Now, let's go back to our code again. This launch is the coroutine builder. Coroutine builders are extension functions of coroutine scopes which are used to launch a new coroutine. There are four main coroutine builders, launch, async, produced, and unblocking. Launch coroutine builder launches a new coroutine without blocking the current thread. This builder returns an instance of job which can be used as a reference to the coroutine. We can use that returned job instance to keep track of the coroutine and to cancel the coroutine. We use launch builder for coroutines that does not have any result as the return value. This builder returns a job instance but does not return any computational result. We cannot use this coroutine to calculate something and get the final answer as the return value. If we want to get such result as a return value, we should use async coroutine builder. Not only that, the main specialty of async builder is that it allows us to launch coroutines in parallel. Async builder also launches a new coroutine without blocking the current thread. This builder returns an instance of deferred of type of the result. Actually, deferred interface is an extension of job interface. So, we can use it like we use job for things like cancelling a coroutine. If our result is a string value, the type would be a string. If our result is an int value, this type would be int, like that. To get the value from deferred object, we need to invoke its await function. In Android development, launch and async builders are the coroutine builders we use most of the time. But we also have produce and run blocking builders. Produce builder is for coroutines which produce a stream of elements. This builder returns an instance of receive channel. In Android development, we use run blocking builder mostly for testing. Not like other coroutines, the coroutine we create using this builder will block the thread until its execution is over and it returns a result which we can directly use. Well, what is structured concurrency? Structured concurrency is a set of language features and best practices introduced for Kotlin coroutines to avoid coroutine leaks and to manage coroutines productively. Hello everyone, welcome back. Let's start this lesson with this app we created during the second lesson of this section. I have added this code project to the resources of this lesson. So if you don't have the project with you, it will be very helpful if you can download it from the resources of this lesson and open it with your Android Studio. Then you will be able to continue coding with me during the lesson. Here we have created two buttons. When we click on this download user data button, it launches a coroutine in a background thread and it starts a long running process. Here we have written codes for that. And when we click on the 
click here button, we can see the number of clicks on the screen. These are the codes we wrote for that process which we created during that previous lesson. Let's run the app. So this is how the app works. Now, during this lesson, we are going to move one step forward and show these results on the user interface. Instead of logging them, we will display them in a text view. We already have a text view included to the activity main.xml file for the task with the ID TV user message. Now, in this example, our long running task executes in a background thread and we are going to display the message. If we write codes to display the message in the text view like this, you know it will not work. In Android, we cannot directly call to a view component running in a UI thread from a background thread like this. If we run this app now, it will crash showing a call from wrong thread exception. Only the original thread that created a view hierarchy can touch its views. Therefore, we have to call views from the UI thread. But fortunately, Coroutines has the easiest way to switch between threads using with context function. We can switch a coroutine from one thread to another. Let me show you how to do it. With context, let's move this code part to the with context function block. We need to provide the context here. As we want to switch to main thread, context should be dispatches.main. There is another new thing. This with context function is a suspending function. We cannot call to a suspend function from a normal function. So we have to add suspend modifier to this function declaration like this. For now, don't worry about suspending functions. I have dedicated our next lesson entirely for suspending functions. So you will be able to learn everything about Kotlin suspending functions during the next lesson. Now, let's just very quickly run this and see it in action. Yes, you can see, app is working as expected. So, this is how we switch a coroutine between threads. In Kotlin coroutines, whenever a coroutine is suspended, the current stack frame of the function is copied and saved in the memory. When the function resumes after completing its task, the stack frame is copied back from where it was saved and starts running again. Kotlin coroutines API provides us a lot of functions to make our works easier. Almost all of them are suspending functions with context, with timeout, with timeout or null, join, delay, await, supervised scope, coroutine scope. There are many suspending functions. These are some examples of suspending functions provided by the Kotlin coroutines API. Not only coroutines library, other libraries such as room and retrofit also provide suspending functions to support us to work with coroutines. If we are ever going to call those first class suspending functions from our functions, we have to mark our functions with suspend modifier, just like we did in the code example of the previous lesson. At the end of the previous lesson, when we were going to use Kotlin with context function to switch the thread of the coroutine to display the result on a text view, we marked this download user data function with suspend modifier. We had to do it. Actually, Android Studio forced us to do so because Inside that function, we were using, we were calling with context function, which is a suspending function, comes with kotlinx.coroutines library. If we are going to use a suspending function such as with context, we have to mark our calling function with suspend modifier. And also, if we are going to invoke another suspending function created by us, we have to also mark that calling function with suspend modifier. With suspending modifier, 
we are actually limiting the use of the function only for coroutines. A suspending function can be called from a coroutine block or from another suspending function only. We cannot invoke a suspending function from a normal function or from other places of the code. Actually, with suspend modifier, we label function as a function with a heavy long running task. And remember, a coroutine can invoke both suspending and regular functions. But a suspending function can be invoked by a coroutine only. Well, now we are going to see what's happening under the hood. To see what's happening under the hood, we need to see Kotlin bytecodes. To do that, let's create a simple Kotlin class. I am including a non-suspending normal function here. And now let's include a suspending function. Let's rebuild the project to generate bytecodes. Now we should go to tools, Kotlin, bytecode. This is the Kotlin bytecode of our suspend demo class. To make it readable, we need to decompile it. Click on this decompile button. OK. This is the decompiled Java file of our suspend demo class. Suspend demo dot decompiled dot Java. So these are the Java interpretations of generated Kotlin bytecodes of two functions we created. Let's have a look again. These are the two functions. First function is a normal function. Second function is a suspendable function. You can see our suspending function has been converted by the compiler to another function without the suspend keyword. But the compiler has added a new parameter of type continuation. So what is this continuation? As you can see, continuation is a Kotlin interface which has all the structure required to resume and suspend functions. So this is my brief overview about suspending functions. I think this lesson provide all the basic knowledge you need about suspending functions and also provide a background to do your own advanced research on suspending functions if you want. So we use suspending functions to avoid threat blockings and hence to provide a smooth uninterrupted experience to our users. This is the simple app we have been creating during this section. You can see these numbers are changing very quickly. But what if we want to slow down them a little bit. To do that, Kotlin X coroutines library has provided delay function. Let me show you how to do it. Let's assume we need to delay each iteration by 3 seconds. Delay pass the duration you want to delay in milliseconds. That's it. Let's run the app and see the results. Yes, app is working nicely as we expected. App is showing the result with 3 seconds delay. What this delay function does is, it places the coroutine in a suspended state for the given period of time without blocking the thread it is running on. So, during that period, the Kotlin runtime can find another coroutine to resume on this thread. This allows coroutines to share thread in a very efficient manner. Let's assume we have to get result from 4 online data sources and combine them all to show the final result to the user. First task takes 10 seconds, second task takes 15 seconds, third task takes 12 seconds and the fourth task takes 
13 seconds. We could easily write codes to download these data sets one by one. But if we do so, user has to wait at least 50 seconds to see the final result. That's too much waiting. Some users may get angry and uninstall them. What if we can download all these data in parallel? If we can do so, we will be able to show the result in just 15 seconds time. Writing codes to download this data in parallel and combine them at the end is called parallel decomposition. Parallel decomposition was not that easy. We had to write complex, long, difficult to read, difficult to maintain codes for that. But with Kotlin coroutines, we can do parallel decomposition very easily. Let me show you how to do it. For this lesson, I created a new Android Studio project. I also added coroutine co and Android dependencies to the Gradle. For this lesson, for the demonstration of the theory, let's just assume we have two remote stores. We need get stock count from both of them using different URLs and show the final stock count to the user. Now, I am going to write a function to get the first stock count. Private Suspend We are going to use coroutines to execute these functions. So let's make them suspendable. Fun Let's name this function as getDistock1 And this should return the stock count as an integral value. To simulate the delay that can happen as a result of data processing in the server, let's just use delay function. We need to add the time in milliseconds. I am delaying the result for 10 seconds. Let's return some value as the stock count. Then we should add a look to see how this works. To the second function, we can just copy this one and change values. Name should be get stock2. Let's delay this for 8 seconds. This should be stock2. Let's change the stock count also. Now let's launch a coroutine in the onCreate function. Coroutine scope. For the context during previous lessons, we added the thread name with the word dispatches. Like here, we can add dispatches.io. I intentionally did that to teach you about dispatches, but to save time, if you want, you can just add io here. Only the name of the thread. The difference is when we add only io, class has to import kotlinx.coroutines.dispatches.io. If we add dispatches.io, our class has to import kotlinx.coroutines.dispatches. Alright, now launch the coroutine. Get the value of the stock one. Then get the value of the stock two. And then add them. For now, let's show the total in a look. I am adding another look to show the start of the calculation process. This is not parallel decomposition. We haven't implemented it yet. This is sequential decomposition. 
What will happen if we run this app? This getDistock1 function will execute first. It will wait 10 seconds and return its stock value. After that, after 10 seconds, execution of getDistock2 function will be started. It will wait another 8 seconds and return its stock value. Then finally, total will be calculated. So, let's just very quickly run that and see it in action. And here we go. Calculation started. Count of the stock one returned after 10 seconds. Count of the stock two returned after 8 seconds. And final total value locked. You can study the exact time gap from here. It took 18 seconds and 33 milliseconds. Now I am going to show you how to do this in parallel way. To do that, we need to use async coroutine builder. Async and launch are the coroutine builders we use for Android development most of the times. Launch coroutine builder returns a job, but async coroutine builder returns an instance of deferred. We can use that deferred value by invoking its await function. I am going to make this function calls from within an async coroutine builder. Async. Let's take this function call to the inside of the builder. Do the same for the get stock to function call. To get the returned value, we need to invoke a wait function of each async builder. Now, if we run this app, these two functions will execute parallelly. Here, get stock one function takes 10 seconds, but get stock two function takes only 8 seconds to return the count value. Therefore, if these two functions execute in parallel, the testoc2 function should return its value first. Let's run the app and see the log results. Calculation is started. Count of the stock 2 returned after 8 seconds. Count of the stock 1 returned after 10 seconds. And final total value looked. So, instead of 18 seconds, this entire process now only takes 10 seconds. Thanks to parallel decomposition, we implemented using async builder and await function call. You can study the exact time from here. Time taken for the entire process is 10 seconds and 49 milliseconds. In this example, we launched a coroutine in a background thread, belong to IO thread pool and did all parallel executions there. But we have other options also. We can also provide dispatches for parallel tasks. Let me show you with a code example. Now I am changing this to dispatches.main just add main and what is today will import dispatches package after that i am going to provide dispatches.io context for each of these async blocks now only these parallel events will happen in the background Since this code block executes in the main thread, we can add a toast message here to show the total value. We can cut the message from here.
let's delete the lock now we can run the app to see the result we need to wait 14 seconds to see the result total is 90000 so this is how we implement concurrency with coroutines this is how we use async and await to get data from different data sources in parallel and combine the result later a job instance is a representation of a coroutine let me explain this with a simple example think about a toy car with a remote controller we used to play when we were kids we would keep the controller with us using that we would know the current status of the toy car we would even use it to stop the car when needed just like that every coroutine has its own job instance attached to it we can use that job instance to know about the coroutine and to cancel the coroutine whenever needed in kotlin coroutines a job can have six status new active completing cancelling cancelled and completed and a job has three boolean variables is active is completed and is cancelled we can use them to know about the status of the coroutine to cancel the coroutine we can invoke cancel function of the job instance a job is active while the coroutine is working when the coroutine finished its task job reached to the completed state if any error happen inside the coroutine job will reach to cancelling state job will also reach to cancelling state if we invoke the cancel function of the job i created this project to show you how this job works here i added gradle dependencies and also i created this user interface to save your time as always you can download this project from the resources of this lesson now this is what we are going to do we are going to launch a coroutine here and from that we will call to a suspending function with the long running task and we will implement the on click listener of one button to display the current status and we will implement cancellation inside the on click listener of the other button let's define a job variable here object type is job let's launch a coroutine as you learned earlier this launch coroutine builder returns a job so we can assign this to the job1 variable we declared now let's very quickly create a suspending function let's use with context function here to switch the coroutine to a background thread instead of a for loop to save time i am going to create a repeat block here this will repeat for third times let's delay each round for 1 second i am also going to include a look here so we will be able to use it to see what's happening
All right. Now let's go to this function from our coroutine. Now let's implement the clickedness. First, let's write codes to cancel the coroutine. Cancel button is the ID. Cancel button dot set on click listener. Job one dot cancel. Now let's implement the set on click listener of the status button. Here we need to consider the status of the coroutine and display a message on the text view accordingly. I am going to use an if else block for this. If job1 dot is active, let's display the message as active. Elsip job one dot is cancelled. Text view dot text equal cancelled. Elsip. This time, let's set the text as completed. Now, if we run this app, as we launched the coroutine directly in the onCreate function, the coroutine will launch immediately. We will be able to explore the execution of the coroutine by looking at the log results. So, if we check the status, we will see it as active. Then, if we let the coroutine to complete and check the status, we will see it as completed. If we cancel this coroutine before the completion, we will see the status as cancelled. Let's run the app and see the results. I am preparing the look at first. Let's run the app now. Yes, you can see the coroutine is running. Let's check the status. It shows active. Let's wait until the coroutine finish its execution. It will repeat only for 30 times. We have to wait because we need to check the completed state. Now the coroutine has completed its execution. Let's check the status again. It shows completed as we expected. Let's run the app again to check the cancellation. We can see the coroutine is executing. I am going to click on the cancel button now. Coroutine is stopped here. You can see it has stopped during the eighth iteration. Let's check the status now. It shows as cancelled. So this is how we can use jobs. For this lesson, to save our valuable time, I am going to use this project we created at the very beginning of this course when we were creating our first core routine. There are situations we need to launch more than one coroutines 
concurrently in a suspending function and get some result returned from the function. There are two ways to do this. We call them structured concurrency and unstructured concurrency. During this lesson, we are going to talk about unstructured concurrency. This is the wrong way to do it. I have seen some junior developers doing this without knowing the consequences. So, I created this lesson to show you what is wrong with the unstructured concurrency. After knowing it properly, during the next lesson, you will be able to learn about the correct way to run multiple coroutines in a suspending function. Now, this is what I am going to do. I am going to create a new Kotlin class and name it as Use Data Manager 1. In that class, I am going to create a suspending function which returns an int value calculated using results of two concurrent operations. I am going to call that new suspending function from the main activity and display the returned value in the text view. So, let's create a new Kotlin class and name it as User Data Manager 1. Now, here I am creating a new suspending function. Let's name it as get total use account. Return type should be int. Let's define an int variable and assign value 0 to it. In Kotlin, we don't need to mention the data type. Kotlin will automatically recognize the data type. Now, as we learned during previous lessons, let's launch a new coroutine in IO Dispatcher. To simulate a long running task, I am delaying this coroutine for one second. Then it's set value 50 to the count variable. Finally, we will return the count value. Now let's switch back to the main activity. Here in the main activity, we can use this click event to show the returned count value in the text view. Let's remove this method call. ID of the text view is TV user message. TV user message dot text equals user data manager dot get total user count. dot to string. We should also change the dispatcher of this coroutine to main. Otherwise, we will not be able to show value on the text view. What would happen if we run this app and click on the button? Here, the initial count value is zero. But by the time this coroutine completes, coroutine will assign 50 to the count value. So, we are expecting this function to return 50 as the count value. Let's run that and see how it works. I am going to click on the button. We got 0 as the returned value. Returned value supposed to be 50, but we received 0. Here this coroutine scope creates a new coroutine which behaves separately from this parent coroutine in the main activity. So this function reaches to the end and returns this count variable's value before the completion of the coroutine. Because of that reason, instead of 50, we got 0 as the result. This is a one weakness of unstructured concurrency. 
unstructured concurrency does not guarantee to complete all the task of the suspending function before it returns actually the child coroutines can be still running even after the completion of the parent coroutine as a result of that there can be unpredictable errors especially if we use launch coroutine builder like we just did but if you use async builder and if you use await function call for the return value you might be able to get the expected result of the async coroutine now i am going to launch another coroutine with async builder i am delaying this for 3 seconds this time let's return 70 since we return from an async block we use return at async here instead of return let's assign the returned value to a variable then here we can use await to get the returned value now when this return statement completes kotlin runtime will come to this place immediately with value 0 but it has to wait 3 seconds until the async block completes to get this deferred value and to complete the return statement so now this statement will return 70 let's run the app and see this in action yes as we expected this time the function returns 70 after 3 seconds delay does this means unstructured concurrency is okay with async builders no still there are problems you know in android if there is an error happen in a function the function throws an exception so we can catch the exception in the caller function and handle the situation in unstructured concurrency whether we use launch or async builders there is no way to properly handle exceptions so even though it seems work well in some scenarios it is not recommended to use the unstructured concurrency all the problems arised during the previous lesson can be easily solved with this core out in scope function notice this simple c here this is not this core out in scope with capital c this is the interface we used throughout this course this new one is a suspending function which allows us to create a child scope within a given core out in scope this core out in scope guarantees the completion of the tasks when the suspending function returns so let me explain this with a coding example i am going to keep this class as an example for unstructured concurrency let's create a new class and name it as user data manager 2 now let's create the suspending function this is the same name we used for the other class we can copy the code from here now instead of creating core routines launching core routines using this core routine scope interface i am going to use coroutine scope suspending function 
inside this new suspending function to provide a child disco. Now we can use launch and async builders inside this child scope. Let's copy the count variable. And also the return statement. Now here, inside this child scope, we can directly use launch coroutine builder to launch a coroutine. We can copy the codes from other class. If we do not add any dispatcher here, this coroutine will launch in the dispatcher of the parent scope. So in our case, parent scope has dispatchers.main. So if we are not going to use any dispatcher here, this coroutine will run in the main thread. But we don't want to do that. So let's add a dispatcher here. Dispatchers.io. Alright. Now let's launch the async builder. I'm going to copy the code from the other class. We can copy this entire part and remove this coroutine scope interface. And here we can provide the dispatcher. This time we need to declare this deferred outside of the scope because we need to get that value from here. Let's declare it here. We are going to initialize the deferred later. So I'm going to use late init keyword. Late init var deferred. This is a deferred instance and its type is int. Now we can assign that to this returned value. Alright, what will happen if we run this app? This coroutine scope interface guarantees the completion of all the tasks within the child scope provided by it before the return of the function. So, once we call to this getTotalUseAccount function, before it returns to the caller, all the core routines launched within this scope will complete. So let's switch back to main activity now. Let's duplicate this statement. Control D. And I'm committing this one. Now let's make this as user data manager 2. So we'll, we'll be able to call to new function we just created. During the previous lesson, we had only 70 as the answer because of a problem arises with unstructured concurrency. Now let's see what is the result of this structured concurrency code. So we are supposed to get 50 plus 70, 120 as the answer. So let's run that and see how it works. Now I'm going to click on the download user data button. Good, as we expected, this time we got 120 as the answer. So, this time our suspending function working properly, working as we intended. Now here, because of this core out in scope, starting with simple C, this core out in scope suspending function, we can have a child scope, which is under the control of parent scope created in the main activity. So, this is the recommended best practice. When you have more than one core routines, you should always start with the dispatches.main using core routine scope interface. And inside suspended functions, you should use core routine scope function 
it is start with the simple C to provide a child scope. So this is structured concurrency. Structured concurrency guarantees to complete all the work started by coroutines within the child scope before the return of the suspending function. Actually, this coroutine scope wait for the child coroutines to complete. Not only that, there are other benefits of this structured concurrency. When errors happen, when exceptions thrown, structured concurrency guarantees to notify the caller so we can handle exceptions easily and effectively. We can also use structured concurrency to cancel task we started. If we cancel entire child scope, all the works happening inside that scope will be cancelled. We can also cancel core routines separately. When we are working with Android Jetpack architecture components, when we are following MVVM architecture, we need to always create view models for activities and for fragments. Now, during this lesson and during next two lessons, I am going to show you some fundamental code patterns for using coroutines with view model and live data. I am not going to create any large Android applications during this lesson and during next two lessons. We will continue with small demo apps. But after that, during other lessons of this course, we will start creating complete projects, applying things we learned during these foundation level lessons. So, here for the demonstration, I just created a new Android Studio project named View Model Scope Demo. And I also added required Gradle dependencies to work with View Model and Live Data, as well as coroutines. Now, I am creating a new View Model class and naming it as Main Activity View Model. Then we need to extend the view model class. As we learned during our previous lessons, in order to run a coroutine, here in this view model, we need a coroutine scope. First of all, we need to define a coroutine scope. Private, well, my scope. Then, Coroutine scope. Let's assume we want to launch the coroutine in a background thread, so we will use dispatchers.io. Our coroutine will run on IO dispatcher. Then I will create a function. Let's say get user data. And now Inside this function, we can launch the coroutine in this way. But this is not complete yet in Android. Every time a view model is cleared from the memory just before the clearing, view model invokes its uncleared method. Uncleared method is always there by default. But if you want to do something just before the clearing, we can manually override the uncleared method like this. Press Ctrl plus O for override methods. Then from Android X dot lifecycle dot view model, select uncleared. Some of the coroutines we launch in a view model has a potential to run even after the view model is cleared from the memory. It might run until our app is terminated. In some scenarios, that would be the intention. But if that's not what we intended, app will be end up leaking the memory. To avoid that, we need to cancel the coroutine within this uncleared function. In order to cancel coroutines started in this scope, we need to pass a job instance for the context of coroutine scope. So, I am going to create a job instance now. Private, well, my job equals job. Now, 
we will add this job to the context of our coroutine scope. This will allow us to control all the coroutines launched in this scope. So, to cancel all the coroutines launched in this scope, only thing we need to do is this. Cancelling coroutines manually, like we just did, might be useful in some situations. But think if we have 20 view model classes in our app. Doing this manually might be unnecessary wasting of time. So to avoid that, to avoid those unnecessary boilerplate codes, we can use view model scope. This new view model scope is bounded to view model's lifecycle. It has created to automatically handle cancellation. When the view model's on clear is called, we can easily use this scope from an extension function available on view model KTX library. So we need to add view model KTX dependency to the grader. Android KTX is a set of Kotlin extensions that are included with Android Jetpack to provide even more concise idiomatic Kotlin to Jetpack and Android platform APIs. To do so, KTX extensions leverage several Kotlin language features such as lambdas, extension functions, and extension properties. Now, in this view model, we can simply use extension property view model scope instead of this my scope created by us. Now we don't need this scope or job. And we don't need to override on cleared. Clearing will be done automatically. So now our code becomes very concise and even more easier to work with. So this is how we do it. A view model scope is defined for each view model in our app. Any coroutine launched in this scope will be automatically cancelled if the view model is cleared. This kind of coroutines are useful here when you have work that needs to be done only if the view model is active. Well, this lesson is almost over, but some of you might need some work in project example with view model scope to see how view model scope interact with other components. For that, I am going to very quickly implement a very basic project example. So if you don't need this code example, you can just move to next lesson. It will save you time. I'm going to get some user data from the repository to an activity through this view model. Instead of displaying them in a recycle view, to save time, let's just lock the values. All right, let's create a new data class called user. This user is going to have an int id and a string name. Now I am creating a new class for the repository. Here I am going to code a getter method to get a list of user instances. In a similar real world situation, this can be a call to a REST API and get users from it or getting a list of users from a local database. But here for the demonstration, I am just creating a new list of objects and returning them. Let's create a suspending function. Suspend fun get users. This will return a list of users. To mimic a long running task, I am delaying this task for 8 seconds. Now we can create a list of users. Well, users colon list user.
equals list of here i am going to create four user instances then we will return the list of users Now it's time to switch back to our new model class. I am creating a new repository instance here. Private var is a users repository equals user repository. Inside this function, we have already launched a coroutine using newly learned view model scope property i am creating a reference variable for the list of users var result list user import the user and question mark to make the object nullable equals null now i am going to get the list of users by invoking the get users function of user repository is a long running task so we should switch the thread of the core routine using with context to a background thread dispatches.io now this core routine will run on the io dispatcher so it will run on the background we are going to send this list to the views as live data for that let's create a new mutable live data instance of list of users then we can set this list of users as the value of mutable live data users instance Let's switch to main activity now. First of all, we need to get the view model instance by using view model provider. Private let in it var main activity view model main activity view model equals view model provider lifecycle owner is this main activity so let's add this dot get main activity view model colon colon class dot java okay now we need to invoke get user data function of this main activity view model Then we will observe the user's live data of main activity view model. Main activity view model dot users dot observe lifecycle owner is this main activity server let's name the list of users we are getting from this live data as my users. Then we can use for each block to iterate through those user objects. You can show this data on recycler view or on a text view. But for now, to save time, I am going to just log the names of each user. Now let's run that and see this in action.
Good, a piece working as expected. During the previous lesson, we discussed about the viewmodel scope. We learned how to easily use this scope from an extension function available with viewmodel KTX library instead of creating new scopes and handling cancellations manually. With the lifecycle runtime KTX library, Google introduced another very useful scope named lifecycle scope. A lifecycle scope is defined for each lifecycle object. Any code routing launched in this scope is cancelled when the lifecycle is destroyed. You can access the code routine scope of the lifecycle either via lifecycle.coroutine.scope or lifecycle.on.lifecycle.scope. Sometimes we need to create coroutines in objects with the lifecycle, such as activities and fragments. This new scope has specially created for those scenarios. All the coroutines in this new scope will be cancelled when the lifecycle is destroyed. So, if it is an activity, all the coroutines in that scope will be cancelled when the onDestroy method of the activity invoked. If it is a fragment, all the coroutines in the fragments scope will be cancelled when the fragments onDestroy method invoked. So, we don't have to manually create a job instance, add job instance to the scope's context, overwrite onDestroy method, and write codes to clear the coroutines. All those things will be handled automatically by the KTX library. So, for this lesson, I am creating a new Android Studio project. This time, I am selecting Fragment plus View Model option because this template will create an activity, a fragment connected to the activity, and a View Model connected to the fragment. This will save our time and I am naming this project as Lifecycle Demo. You can see we have an activity, Pregment and a view model. Here in the Gradle, we already have Lifecycle extensions and Lifecycle view model KTX libraries added. In order to use new Lifecycle scope, we also need to add Lifecycle runtime KTX library. I am adding it now. Also, I am changing this to the latest version since we are going to use this diff arc version statement, which is in single quotes. We need to make these double quotes. Also, for coroutines, we need to add these dependencies. You can download this project from the resources of this lesson. So, if you want, you can easily copy these dependencies from that project. Let's switch to the main activity now. Working with lifecycle scope is very straightforward. Lifecycle scope dot launch. This is it. As an example, you would use this core routine to display a progress bar or some message. Let's add the progress bar to activity underscore main dot XML file. I am setting the visibility as gone. I am going to make it visible within the core routine. I am also setting the width and height as match parent. Let's switch to the main activity. Here, I am going to start the progress bar after 5 seconds and end it after 10 seconds. We can use suspending function delay for that. Delay 5000 milliseconds. Then progress bar dot visibility equals view dot visible. Then again delay for 10,000 milliseconds. progress bar dot visibility equals 
view dot go on. So let's just very quickly run that and see it in action. We should now see progress bar starting after 5 seconds. And here we go. This would rotate for 10 seconds. And it is stopped. So, this works as we expected. This core routine runs in the main thread. If we want this core routine to run in a separate thread, we can easily define the context for the launch core routine builder like this. Now this will run on a worker thread. Let's remove this progress bar now because it would cause an error if we try to call a progress bar from a worker thread. So for now let's just add a log message to see the current thread. I'm going to test this now. Yes, as we intended, thread is default dispatcher work one. I am copying this code block. Now let's switch to our fragment. We can use this lifecycle scope in fragments too. All the active coroutines in the activity or fragment will automatically terminate just before the activity or fragment ends. Sometimes we might need to suspend execution of a code block considering the current state of a lifecycle object. For that, we have three additional builders. Lifecycle scope dot launch when created. If you have some long running operations, which should happen only once during the life cycle of the activity or fragment, you would use this core routine. So this core routine will launch when the activity or fragment created for the first time. We also have lifecycle scope dot launch when started. So in this case, core routine will launch when the activity or fragment is started. Let's say we need to run a fragment transaction inside our core routine scope. For that, we need our fragment lifecycle to be at least started. We can write that code inside this code block. And finally, we have lifecycle scope dot launch when resumed. This is the state in which the app interacts with the user. If we have a requirement to start a long running task just after the app is up and running, we would use this lifecycle scope dot launch when resumed. Hello everyone, welcome back. During previous two lessons, we discussed about view model scope and lifecycle scope. Now, during this lesson, we are going to discuss about newly introduced live data builder. To use this, we need to add live data KTX library 2.2.0 alpha 1 or higher version to our project. To show you the benefits of this new feature, I am going to use the project we created during the first lesson of this section. As always, if you want, this project is available for you to download as the starter project of this lesson. Here we have added lifecycle and core out dependencies. We created a data class and named it as user. This user class has two properties, int id and string name. Then we created a repository class named user repository. This user repository has a suspending function named getUsers, which returns a list of user instances. Here we have used this delay function to simulate a long running task. Then we created a view model class, named it as main activity view model. Here we have created this getUsers function. In that we have a view model scope to launch a new core routine. 
we studied about view model scopes during the first lesson of this section. Then here we have defined a list. Then we have used with context function to switch the thread of the coroutine to a background thread. And here we have invoked the getUsers function of the repository and get the list of use objects. And finally assigned that to the value of mutable live data. You can see we need to invoke this getUsers function before observing the values of this mutable live data. In the main activity, we wrote codes to invoke getUsers function and to observe the list of users. If we run this app, we will be able to see the log results. Let's run that. Log results will appear after 8 seconds delay. Yes, it worked as we expected. Now, let me show you how to do this in a much easier and in a much efficient way. We need to add live data ktx library to the grader. Version should be 2.2.0 alpha 01 or higher. With the 2.2.0 alpha 01 version, Android Dark Rich Components team introduced a new core routine building block for live data. This new block will automatically execute when the live data becomes active. It automatically decides when to stop executing and cancel the core routines inside the building block considering the state of the life cycle owner. Inside the live data building block, you can use emit function to set a value to the live data. Now, I am going back to main activity view model class. Let me show you how to do this using new live data builder. I am commenting this first. Wa users equals live data. We need our long running task to be executed in a background thread. So I am adding dispatchers.io as the context. Now we need to get the user data from the repository. Well, result user repository dot get users. Now we can emit the result. See how many less code lines we have now. Let's move to main activity. We don't need to invoke a function like this now. Let's comment it. So let's run that very quickly again and see it in action. Here we go. Is working as it was worked before, but this time with very less amount of code. 